So uh, today we'll talk actually about concrete. And by the way of concrete, I will make two presentations, one about Santiago Calatrava, who obviously loves concrete, and about brutalist architecture. We'll start with Santiago Calatrava. So Santiago Calatrava Gols, apparently has another name there, was born in 1951, is a Spanish architect, structural engineer, sculptor, and painter particularly known for his bridges supported by single leaning uh, pylons, pylons and his railway stations, stadiums and museums of sculptural forms often resemble living or organisms. Living, living, but in, in concrete. Let's not, uh, let's not get um, you know, uh, too attached to the idea they are, they are uh, you know, truly living organisms. They are not, they are made of concrete. His best known works include the Olympic Sports Complex in Athens, the Milwaukee Art Museum, which I saw, the Turning Torso Tower in Malmö, which I saw in Sweden, the World Trade Center Transportation Hub in New York City, which fortunately, fortunately I didn't see. It's a, it's, it's a terrible building. The Auditorio de Tenerife, Tenerife in Santa Cruz, the Margaret Hunt Hill Bridge in Dallas, Texas, and his largest project, the City of Arts and Sciences, an opera house in his birthplace, Valencia. In Spain, his architectural firm has offices in New York City, Doha, and Zurich. A so-called success story. This is the man. Uh, he doesn't look too happy, and I think uh, despite the appearances, uh, I think he should have actually some uh, guilt on his uh, on his shoulders. Uh, this, yes, I begin with this work, which was not mentioned, is a bridge that he built near Santa Lucia train station in in Venice. And if you go this year to see the Venice Biennial, once you, because you will arrive at the train station, is unavoidable almost unavoidable, uh, a little bit, some meters to the right as you exit uh, the train station is this bridge by, uh, by uh, Calatrava, which is um, very uninspired and it was critic criticized by the, by the Italians and uh, not only by the Italians. Attenzione, pavimento scivoloso. Uh, let's see. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have an image of that uh, bridge, but you can find it on Google Images, uh, uh, Bridge, Venice, Santiago, Calatrava. I, 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 I used that bridge a few times, and I have to tell you, it's, uh, it's not doing justice to the great city of Venice. Uh, this is an early work by him, um, 1985 in Germany. Uh, he is a skillful builder. He is a skillful engineer. He is a skillful architect, but maybe too skillful. I know it sounds paradoxical, what I just said. But I, I, I think he's some kind of a virtuoso. Frank, uh, Kenneth Frampton uh, published once a text about him called Look, No Hands, like, like someone who is using a bicycle and takes the hands off from the uh, handles of the bicycle, you know, just to show off that he can bike without uh, controlling the the bike with, with the hands. I think it was rather appropriate, uh, this title. There, there is a certain level of showmanship in what he does, in his expressionist technique. But I do have to say that the tower in Malmö that I saw, I admire, and it is... Uh, uh, it is um, uh, remarkable, and it was built many years ago. Well, in 2005, as you can see, the, the torn, turning torso. Um, I saw also the Milwaukee Art Museum from 2001. Uh, and but we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about this um, this works. Puente de la Milo Savilla, 1992. Yes, we could say, look, no hands. I mean, it, it is a tour de force, but it is, I don't know. I, I, I think a great creator is someone who is both an eagle and a snake. 
in other words, can fly, but can also uh, have, uh, uh, you know, uh, the attachment to the earth that a snake has. I guess what I'm trying to say is someone who, who is, um, uh, um, you know, very assertive. That's what I meant by, by flying and also modest. I'm not so sure that uh, they are perfectly balanced in his case. Um, despite his, uh, you know, uh, uh, posturing in, uh, you know, without an uh, extremely happy face in, uh, in, in some pictures. But I will arrive at, at some of some pictures, I think, later. But even here, you know, you see this uh, showy display of uh, honoring the static forces. Yes, you could say in a dynamic way. After all, I do like diagonals, but it is a little bit flamboyant for my taste, what I see here. It's very graphic. It's very graphic and it works, yes. But when you look at the actuality of the bridge, the bridge is actually not so, it doesn't appear to be so huge. And, and you know, he occupies, a, a significant uh, portion of the sky with, with this uh, structure. The diagonal element is almost as long as the length of the, of the, of the bridge itself. Uh, what is this in Valencia? Uh, um, is it the same bridge or? Uh, I don't know. Um, Again and again, we are dealing with Anthropos. We are dealing with a powerful human being who is uh, taking off his hands from the, um, you know, the handles of the of, of the of the bicycle. Uh, but uh, maybe a time will come when we'll uh, look a little bit more carefully at these so-called uh, tour de force. Here is the man. I know some people admire very much his watercolors. I think they are terrible. They are, they are the watercolors of a, of a non-artist. They are the watercolors of an engineer. And I'm not saying that an engineer cannot paint. Yes, a good engineer can also paint. And, uh, and uh, I, I would be the first to, 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 to encourage an engineer to paint. But his watercolors are so, you know, so literal, so, ah. Anyway, we'll, we'll arrive, I hope, to some images with his watercolors. City of Arts and Sciences in Valencia. Yes, they are impressive, these buildings, but there is a, a feeling of emptiness in, in the end. I mean, all this monumentality, and you know, and I don't know. Maybe I'm jealous, maybe I'm envious, but no, no, it's not that. It's, it's all this, uh, it's, it's very showy. It's a showy architecture. And I think great architecture is, has elements of, uh, of uh, you know, what we call a show, but but here the, the, the showmanship is a little bit, I think, uh, uh, too extravagant and in a way with, a, with an optimism which is not really sustainable. You know, all this, I mean, he probably built the biggest cantilever part, uh, concrete, of course, uh, in the world, the Rio de Janeiro, and we are going to see it. But even here in Valencia, you know, these giant, structures, you know, which are, uh, you know, uh, sculptural and I'm tempted to like them, but I'm not sure I, 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 I understand some, some parts. I am not a functionalist, but I, I don't know. I mean, what is this piece here? And we are going to see another work also with uh, these extravagant uh, things that, yes, they, they are done impeccably. Yes, they do not fall apart. Yes, the, the shapes are, you know, seductive, but I don't know. Are they are they encouraging life actually with their monumentality? I am not sure. I am not sure that his expressionist technique is always um, 
you know, uh, profound. In some cases, maybe it is more than in some other cases. I saw the building in Milwaukee and we'll arrive there. Um, I don't know. But one, one thing is for sure. This is concrete. It's done with concrete. It's a lot of concrete. And um, I look at it and uh, I almost feel like saying art and science had become leisure uh, activities, kind of like uh, it's something uh, that brings them together with uh, entertainment when art and science shouldn't be like this. I mean, if I look at these buildings and I reflect on, one ble on what Blaise Pascal said, that all the troubles of humankind are because we cannot stand, sit quietly in a room, but that's what uh, an artist and the, and the, and the scientist uh, need, a room. But here we see this, um, you know, uh, it's more for my, for me, it's more like the, the city of entertainment than, than the city of arts and, 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 and science. It's, it's a triumphalist architecture. And I think true art and true science are actually, should turn their backs on triumphalism. Again, they are seductive, but kind of in an empty way, in a, in a, in a rhetorical way. I mean, I wonder what Vincent van Gogh would have said if he was moving around this building. Do you think Vincent van Gogh would have felt tempted to paint this building instead of sunflowers? I don't think so. I think he would have preferred the sunflowers. There is a certain level of demagogy, in my opinion, in his work. But some works are better, and I hope I have here some examples of, 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 of those works which I consider to be better. I mean, as I said, I saw the tower he built in Malmö in Sweden. In Sweden, there is a infinitely more, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he wasn't so modest. I'm talking about Sigurd Leverenz at a very, he was an engineer too, but Sigurd Leverenz was, was a very subtle architect who arrived at a very poetical um, you know, way of doing architecture something, uh, in my opinion, much deeper than everything uh, Santiago Calatrava did with all his, uh, you know, flamboyance. Uh, I don't think in terms of depth, you can compare uh, Sigurd Leverenz with uh, Santiago Calatrava. But he, Leverenz is not so well known while uh, Santiago Calatrava is a star, isn't he? Uh, just here, you know, we just read about concrete. I mean, there is so much concrete, you know, so much cement being used here in, in Valencia for uh, the vision of an architect. Okay, it's good to have visions. It's good to have visionary projects and visionary buildings. But what is this? When I, if I saw the, uh, just this image, I would say this is a stadium. This is a stadium. It's not a stadium. It's the city of arts and, 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 and uh, science. What does this have to do with art and science? They are grandiose, but they are grandiose, but without that um, cosmic thinking and feeling of, uh, let's say, bullet. Now, he didn't make this statue here, but kind of 
you know, the statue matches the buildings, you know, the exotism of the other, the exotism of the extravagant, uh, you know, uh, uh, gone ages, you know, that this, this um, archaic uh, animals, it's all about, it's all about the, the immense boredom of, 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 of the contemporary man, you know, we need uh, Steven Spielberg, we need exotic animals brought to life from uh, death, uh, we need the structures of Santiago Calatrava, because otherwise we die of boredom. But there are hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of millions of people who die of hunger. Yes, we, you know, we, we have these images, you turn on the TV and what do you see? You know, you see uh, extravagant uh, scenes of um, unbelievable, uh, uh, you know, uh, so-called realities that, that, that make us uh, believe for a short while that uh, our life is adventurous, when in fact we, we lay on the sofa and we are immensely bored deep down, if not depressed. In a way, this thing that we look at here in the, for, in the foreground matches the buildings and the buildings match the, it's, 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 it's again, it's, it's SF, it's, it's not real actually. Yes, they, they are built impeccably, uh, uh, but I don't know, City of Arts and Sciences, Valencia. Now the Milwaukee Art Museum uh, in 2001, I told you, I, I saw this building, I was there. I, I appreciated much more, a much more modest building by, a, in my opinion, a great architect, Hero Sarinen, who unfortunately died at 50, that is, actually very close to this building. In fact, they, they touch each other and I hope I have some images with the building by Sarin and, uh, as well. Now this building is supposed to have two wings that open. We see here this, uh, this wing and th there is another one. Of course, there are two wings, they open. I mean, really, do we need uh, we buildings with wings? that, uh, you know, with an immense consume of energy are supposed to be lifted, uh, you know, uh, certain times and why? Why? It's, this is showmanship. This is not true creation. This is showmanship. A true creator is beyond showmanship. Yes, it's interesting. Yes, it's seductive, but it's kind of an empty seductiveness, in my opinion. The bridge, the bridge is used everywhere. He loves bridges. And look, look, the building, but this is, this is very rhetorical. You know, the, the building you say is ready to fly. I'm sorry, Mr. Calatrava, but the building is not meant to fly literally. The building is meant to fly metaphorically. The way the, the Gothic cathedral built in the Gothic times in the Middle Ages was attempting to, you know, transcend the limitations imposed on us by gravity, but symbolically and metaphorically, not literally, not the, the, the cathedrals didn't, didn't need wings. So this is the illusion of, you know, I mean, it's ridiculous actually, those wings make you think that the building is a bird, but you see clearly that the bird is attached to the, to the bridge with cables. So it's actually an entrapped bird, bird between quotation marks. So it's a contradiction in terms. Why do you, why do you, why do you conceive those huge wings and the apparatus that makes them, uh, you know, leave the body of the so-called bird when it actually cannot fly. And not only that it cannot fly, but you actually show clearly that the building is attached to the, you know, the horizontal structure, the bridge with cables. It's, it's actually imprisoned. The bird is imprisoned. It's showmanship. This is the building by, um, by Eero Sarina that I mentioned. I hope I have images also during the day. It's also a museum. And it's much more modest than this, um, you know, uh, 
Calatrava Bonanza. But I appreciate this more, although I'm, you know, maybe I, 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 I had, uh, I have a certain reputation for fighting against uh, Kumpatare, against, uh, you know, uh, excessive reticence. But in this case, I admire more the reticence in this building because Sullivan, uh, Sarinan also built the TWA um, terminal at uh, the JFK airport, which is also with organic. And it's also, you know, like a bird in flight. But there, the symbolism is more acceptable because it is about, uh, you know, a terminal, an airport. It's about the, the flight of, the, of the, the airplanes. Here you could say it's about the flight of imagination of the artist. Okay, I can understand that art is supposed to uplift us, to make us uh, long for the height, for the above, for the distant horizons. But the expenditures, the amount of uh, effort here for uh, something, uh, I would say uh, explicitly impossible is to me unconvincing. As unconvincing is this interior, you know, very, very slick and very polished and very whitish and, and uh, hopefully, yes, there is art. But without the art, the interior is um, depressingly, um, you know, hyper clean, or I don't know how to call it. This is a watercolor by him, you know, I mean, who is there on the left, Adam and Eve, and I, I don't know. These are affectations, in my opinion. I don't like his watercolors at all, because they are, they are illustrative, they are illustrations, they are not artistic works, they are Yes, it looks splendid, but look at the bird on the sky. That bird is flying. This one is trapped to the earth, and, and, and it's just a, an illusion and a delusion. These wings are delusional. Fortunately, we have Auguste Rodin with his beautiful uh, uh, sculpture uh, here in the foreground. Finally, a sign of life. Because in my opinion, the building is only mimicking life. Milwaukee Art Center by Sarin. So now I show you the building that is next door, so to speak, from 1957. So 43, 44 years earlier was built this more modest building, but in my opinion, a superior architecture to the, to the building by um, uh, Calatrava. This is the building built by a, a very important architect, Hiro Sarinan. Um, his father also was a very important architect, uh, Eliel Sarinan. Okay, it's not so spectacular, the building, this building by, by Sarinan, but I kind of like it more than the, than, than the building by, uh, um, by Calatrava. And there is a beautiful staircase there. We are going to see it hopefully. Here you see the building by Calatrava actually arriving at the very edge of the property on which the building by Sarinan was built. In my opinion, again, this is a superior building to the showy building by, by Calatrava. It's even built, the tectonics are rather cheap, actually. It looks spectacular because of, you know, all that uh, bonanza drama with the wings open, but it's actually built uh, rather in a cheap way. And in a few more images of the Sarinan building. Uh, Milwaukee. Um, yeah, the aesthetics, you know, I mean, the sculpture, the, the statue doesn't belong to Sar Sarinan, of course. Um, it's a more modest building, yes, but this staircase shows, uh, you know, subtlety of, as an uh, architecturally speaking. And uh, 
you, you see from this picture on the right, Calatrava, a little bit above and on the left, Sarinan. I think Sarinan again is more convincing as an architect in, in this particular case. And this staircase, I think, is, uh, is excellent by Sarinan in the courtyard of this museum. Anyway, we're moving forward. Uh, here is actually the TWA um, terminal on the Kennedy Airport in New York, by built by the very author of this building, Eero Sarina. In a way, you could say it's, I don't know if Calatrava was thinking about this because he knew he was building, you know, next to the building by Sarina. There are some echoes of this building into the building by, uh, by Calatrava. But I think this one is more convincing. Its organicity is more, it's less forced and even its tectonics. Of course, he, Sarina also used concrete, but this was built, I don't know when, you know, maybe, I don't know in what year he died. He died at 50, sorry, unfortunately. Maybe this was been built in, uh, in the 50s, in the 20th century. And I don't know if you know the story, after or around the time he was building this building, he was chosen to, to preside over the jury for the competition for the opera in Sydney, Australia. And it's a very interesting story that he, Iro Sarinan, the author of this building in New York, arrived in Sydney one day later. The plane didn't fly on the day it was supposed to fly. It flew to Australia one day later. So he arrived in Sydney to judge, to evaluate the, the works, the projects submitted for the opera in Sydney. And in the meantime, in that, during that day when he was absent, the other members of the jury already banished the project by John Hudson. And uh, Iro Sarinan uh, was curious to see the buildings that were already eliminated. And he discovered the, the project by John Hudson and being the, the chief of the jury, and also being that he was designing this particular building that you look at now, he advocated the cause of John Hudson, and that's why Sydney has now the opera in Sydney. You see, if he didn't, if he didn't want to look at the, the, the eliminated works, Sydney would have had another building, not the one that it has now. This is, in my opinion, again, uh, Sarinan is a superior architect or at least in these works compared to uh, Calatrava. And, and he worked here without uh, parametry, without uh, you know, uh, computer technology or anything. This was all uh, done with the so-called traditional means, but uh, uh, done brilliantly. Anyway, this presentation is not about Sarinan, but you know, by the way of the museum in Milwaukee, I thought that I should show this work as well. Now the Athens Olympic Sports Complex by uh, Calatrava, we know already by now his architectural language. We know it. It's as, as it was described, expressionist technique, technical expressionism. Uh, the ex expressionism of an engineer in a way. Yes, he does uh, spectacular stru structures. Nobody would contest this. Sometimes uh, in uh, almost moving ways, but other times in a very demagogical way, like the transportation hub in, in New York, which is a disaster. And uh, it's not that I am saying this, uh, many people in New York think so and uh, wrote against it and we are going to arrive there. Anyway, this is in Athens. Um, Anyway, this presentation today was supposed to be about concrete. And he does work a lot with concrete, but not only with concrete, 
this one also is from 2012. Now look at this one. You know, it, of course, it resembles the one in, in, in Valencia. But what is this thing here? You know, and I'm not a functionalist, but really, what is this thing here? You know, uh, yes, it's, it's, it's amazing, no? This thin shell of concrete, reinforced concrete, but, but what is it made for? What is it? I mean, again, I'm not a functionalist, but why is it there? Just to 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 achieve some uh, so-called uh, spectacular effect. I'm talking about this thing here. What is this? I'm, I'm not going to read this text. We still have to see other things, so we move forward. But um, again, I, in my opinion, is the assault of man on on the world, on nature, on the earth. You know, why did he do it this way? Because yes, we can. This is what human beings say. They even write on T-shirts, on, on sneakers. Yes, we can. Yes, I can. But is it enough justification for our gestures? We just do things because we can do them? I don't even find his drawings. Um, if, we if I compare this sketch with the uh, sketches of Michelangelo for uh, forts that I showed um, the other day when, when uh, we paid homage to Michelangelo, we see two different kinds of artists and spirits. Michelangelo was a true artist. This drawing is weak. It's a weak drawing. It's, it doesn't have artistic force. And uh, yes, the structure is uh, spectacular and catchy, but again and again, what is this thing here? Param pam pam. In a way, I didn't invent this word. I didn't even know there is such a word, but somebody used it to describe his, his architecture. Param pam pam with exclamation marks. Param pam pam. That is an empty triumphalism. It is just this param pam pam. Yes, it's, it's incredible. I mean, look at this thin uh, shell of concrete. It's, it's, but it is a param pam pam architecture. And it would have been much better without this, this part, which is even threatening. And look, of course, we talked about showmanship, right? Come on, this is ridiculous. I mean, this, uh, this man is posing here as, he, as his, uh, you know, uh, blue collar worker, um, 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 you know, uh, create making uh, concrete, right? It's showmanship. This is this is cheap showmanship. You know, he's no Brunelleschi, you know, or uh, Antoni Gaudi living in Sagrada Familia. He's a spoiled, uh, uh, highly successful architect, immensely rich, who is only posing here, you know, like. Uh, uh, you know, he's uh, contributing physically to the erection of his big ego, but uh, it's pathetic, really. This was done just for the camera, and I'm sure afterwards, very quickly, he changed his attire and, uh, you know, dressed uh, impeccably in uh, who knows what. Uh, I don't want to give the impression that I am envious, because I'm not, but I, I just don't think that a serious architect or artists to do this, this sort of thing. This is done for the cameras. Uh, okay, he made us smile a little bit. For that, uh, we, we, we are grateful to him. But we are not grateful to him for this uh, monstrous thing he did here. No, this, this is an empty gesture. 
and uh, maybe enough reason to, uh, you know, reconsider him. Anyway, that's what I think. Uh, the Tenerife, Tenerife Auditorium. Uh, <laughs> Communications tower in Barcelona. This also I remember. I saw this one is also this kind of hands off the bike. You know, yes, he has some uh, some uh, uh, you know uh, ability to uh, you know create a little bit of drama out of nowhere and for no reason. You know, like like this thing. You know, this thing is standing uh, on this little point and it gives you the impression that. Uh, you know, is defying gravity and so on. But uh, it's very graphic. It's you could say, come on, it's the triumph of the human spirit, right? The triumph of the human spirit for who knows what company, Telefonica. Uh, <laughs> Capitalism and it's most sublime. <laughs> it's just him and the sun or the moon or some distant stars. But he is seductive. Many people are seduced because, you know, he's uh, riding the bicycle without using his hands on the arms of the bicycle. Uh, here we have, uh, you know, the bottom. Unfortunately, these people, I hate the way they put their names, you know, the, the author, he dream time, dreams time, dreams time, in a way, that's what it is about, dreams time. But I think Antoni Gaudi was more than just this empty, showy dreams time. But I like this picture. I, I don't know what it is for. I mean, this is not Calatrava. I don't know why I included it in the, in the presentation. In its modesty, it's much more poetical and uh, you know meaningful to me than than you know the the adventures in engineering of Calatrava. But this building, as I said, I did like. I saw it there and I, I admired it. Uh, this uh, turning torso, as he called it, and he built it. You know, many years before. Now it's very common to have uh, twisting uh, towers. But he built uh, before the year 2000s. And uh, yes, here the engineering is in, uh, impeccable. And uh, I think this tower is very convincing. Whatever I said before, please, for a while, uh, forget what I said. This building I like. But then I liked it because I was also very impressed by the city of the future that Malmö built around this tower. I was so impressed that me coming from uh, Chicago or New York, I even forgot, but I felt as a provincial, you know, primitive man arriving in Malmö in Sweden. I felt that they were in advance of us, meaning by us, you know, people coming from the United States, some good tens of, uh, tens of, uh, of years, you know, like, 20, 30, 40 years, if you can say something like this. Very advanced, the city of the future in Malmö. These Swedes are very sophisticated and uh, uh, I was very impressed by the tower, but not only by the tower, the buildings they built around this tower and the, the people, you know, the, I don't, I don't know, there was a level of sophistication there that made me feel as if I came from a so-called third world country, when in fact I came from the United States. Yes, I, I, I felt that they were much more sophisticated than, than the society I, I came from. And I do like this tower. Bravo for it, Monsieur Calatrava. Not everything you do is bad. And yes, I'm talking about this uh, housing complex, which was not built by uh, Calatrava. I don't know who built them. But it, it is a portion of Malmö called the city of the future. At least that's how it was called when I was there in, before the year 2000. And this is the plan of the building. 
no, definitely he did a good job in um, in uh, in uh, Malmo. Oh, uh, he of course he is um, is uh, trying hard to ruin uh, you know the reason for the applauses. We didn't need this literal uh, you know uh, explanation. You know that the torso is uh, informing the building is. Uh, I don't know. I mean, there are so many twisted buildings, towers like this these days, and I'm sure they were not inspired by the so-called, um, you know, torso that uh, he refers to. But it's a, it's a good building, and uh, wherever you photograph it from, it looks good. Calatrava in Sweden. Of course, this is not built for, um, you know, um, proletarians, but. Hello, Mr. Calatrava, you did a good job here. Don't be sad. We are proud of you, Mr. Calatrava. We really are. For this work, not for others, and certainly not for what you did in New York. You, you probably hate New York. He also built, a, um, you know, an Orthodox church there you know, close to the former World Trade Center, that building is also not good. Now, let's read here. Aside from being the 2014 winner of the biggest loser, bungled Chicago developments, Calatrava is known for suing and being sued, going over budget and being made fun of by hackish New York food critics. Oh, and the all white other world, worldliness of his designs. I didn't write this text. I found it on the web. So aside from being the 2014 winner of the biggest loser bungled Chicago development, he proposed a huge tower there, which was not uh, realized. Calatrava is known for suing and being sued. So, you know, a lot of things happen in the, uh, you know, uh, palaces of justice of this world, going over budget and being made fun of by hackish New York food critics, oh, and the all white uh, other worldliness of his designs. This is probably a reference to the to what he built in New York City. But first, let's see this tower he proposed for uh, Chicago. And uh, I'm happy actually it was not built because it, it, it would not have really added anything to, to the city of Chicago. I'm sure Chicago was very sad that it was not built. Now the infinity tower in Dubai, you know, twisted architecture again, again and again. We already saw what he did in Malmö. We see now what he did in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in uh, Dubai, infinity tower. Um, this chairman right with the Spanish Swiss architect Santiago Calatrava. Here they are. And, uh, you know, the, this tower is, uh, I hope it, it will not be built in the name of sustainability. Oh my God, my God, you know, what would these, um, what would these Arabs do without the, you know, uh, oil? What would they do without that oil? But that oil at one point will end. But until then, let's go to, the, to God himself all the way up. Must be good to have money. And look at it. <laughs> poor poor uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, you know. He proposed a one mile uh, tall building and he was, he, he was sort of being, uh, uh, you know, a madman, uh, but at, at a different age than Calatrava. Taller and taller. And of course, if he builds it, another architect will come and will make one twice the size, the height of this one. Why? Because there is gas. Is this the triumph of the human spirit? I don't know. I'm not so sure. 
But yes, it is. It is amazing. I mean, look, look at its height. Now it's very possible that underneath this uh, splendid tower there is a vertical city filled with cars. This man here is the ruler of Abu Dhabi, and he is even. Um, or Dubai, one of the two. He even writes poems, and he's an interesting man, actually. Uh, unbearably rich, of course. So what do we see here? Well, some of the towers built by humankind, and, and, and the one by, and this is, this is actually a, a perfectly legitimate self-portrait of Calatrava. Not only that it is so tall, but look at the base. I mean, compared to all the other the skyscrapers, this man is covered a huge amount of earth at the bottom in order to, and I'm not sure he needed actually such an extravagant uh, footprint for, uh, for this building. giving a talk. What surprises me also is how unromantically he is dressed. I mean, for a man who does watercolors and is an artist, he's dressed like a businessman, you know? At least Frank Lloyd Wright was dressing uh, very romantically and even Le Corbusier. But this man, actually the way he is dressed, um, uh, matches uh, his watercolors, which are which are not the wa watercolors of an artist. That's why I didn't say artist. I said artist, because in English there is a difference between the two. Now Calatrava in New York. Here we arrive at his um, greatest calamity until now, bigger than the bridge in Venice and bigger than um, than other things. The WTC Transportation Hub, the World Trade Center Transportation Hub, which he completed after the Twin Towers fell to the ground. Uh, here is during the construction. And uh, <laughs> this is not a cathedral. This is a transportation hub, a view of the interior. Okay, maybe for a short while you would be tempted to say wow, a kind of a whitish wow. But I don't know. It's what did he want to say with this giant space? You know, it's a transportation hub, for God's sake. You take the subway from there, okay? You take the subway from there. You are not uh, praying, uh, you are not in the Charter Cathedral, you, you are in a transportation hub, and look how it looks from the outside. I read that actually children are scared of these things. Again, wings, but wings, but, but look at these spikes. They're immense. I mean, look at the car and look at these spikes on both sides. This is, I, I would say, rather... Uh, if if I neglect the fact that it's a whitish white building, it's 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 rather it's not an expression of love. It's it's I almost feel like saying it's an expression of hate, because this uh, aggressive uh, so-called uh, architectural bird. I read that <clears throat> children are scared of those spikes, and we are going to read some 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 remarks about it from New Yorkers. Now, what is the symbolism of these uh, static wings? Why did he make them? I mean, in the case of Sarin at JFK airport, you say, okay, it's an airport, right? You take the plane and you fly. But here you take the subway, you go underground 
and you take a subway which goes underneath the earth and is certainly not flying. And it's not an art museum to say, okay, you are flying through imagination through some, to, towards some distant uh, horizon. Yes, it's, it's an amazing effort. In you, you can imagine the budget for this. That's why he is sued and he sues. I mean, we are talking about tens, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars. For what? For a subway station? Now the Grand Central uh, uh, you know, terminal in New York where you take the train and so on is, has a certain monumentality, but nothing like, the, like this. I don't know why I don't trust you, Monsieur Scalatrava. I really don't. I like your tower in Malmö, but I don't like uh, what I see in this picture. I really don't. I'm sorry. And I didn't like that posing of you uh, making, uh, making uh, concrete, you know, like a blue collar worker, really. Now, New York's $4 billion shrine to government waste and idiocy. That's how it was described, this uh, uh, project built by this guru architect, Santiago Calatrava. $4 billion. That is, uh, let me see, I don't even know if I can count well. 4,000, wait a minute, a billion is uh, one... Uh, is 1,000 millions? I think so. I mean, I, I'm not accustomed to, to, to count in this, um, in, in Romanian, it's a you know, milliard, four of them. So somebody, I think, with enough justification wrote a shrine to government waste and idiocy. And let's read a little bit about it because uh, I think New Yorkers knew what they said what what they said to say that santiago calatrava international star architect and grand purveyor of winged white things is not exactly a media darling would be an understatement akin to architecture in china is fairly creative or daniel lipskin is not quite the most beloved architect around in march for example the new york times said calatrava's world trade center transit hub a structural bird in flight, you know, Brunkush did some birds in flight, but uh, very different from, from Calatrava's work, set to wrap construction at the end of 2014, had clunky fixtures and some rough workmanship that made it look cheap, like I mentioned with the museum in um, Milwaukee. Of course, before that, the Spanish city of Valencia sued the architect because his grossly over budget opera house was oh, kind of falling apart. And now the New York Post, Steve Cuozo, a critic that often sticks to restaurant reviews, has unleashed the harshest, most outlandish critique of them all. Here comes the Calatrasaurus. <laughs> you know, not the dinosaurus, but the Calatrasaurus. It begins and it doesn't mellow out from there. Below, a visual tour of the most insane lines from the critique. Let's read, uh, let's continue to read what this man wrote. A self-indulgent, or I don't know, no, I only have this from his text, but I have a few fragments from other, you know, uh, words related to this uh, building. A self-indulgent monstrosity like plastic mutant terrors of 1950s science fiction movies. Somebody wrote, like plastic mutant terrors of 1950s. Uh, what is written here? Not everyday ugly, like a tacky brown tie or dress, but lol ugly. <laughs> you know, these are, these are the perceptions, the words of New Yorkers. They hate it, and it was built. It was built with uh, insane amounts of money. Why? Because, uh, you know, people love showmanship. 
may frighten small children. Somebody wrote, and I read, I read the more text like this, or the 4 billion shrine to government waste and idiocy, that we already know and we already read. Bureaucracy fed vain glory. And indeed, vain glory it is. Uh, look at me, I'm Kalatrava. Somebody wrote. I don't think all these people were, gen, you know, uh, envious or, or jealous. No, no, it's not this. It's it's really uh, it's really it's it's not a great architecture. It's a great uh, will to impress, maybe by an insecure man, uh, somebody that that is not my arrow, the the red arrow. I found it like this on the web. What are those spikes? Can you imagine how much steel went into those useless spikes, which are huge, huge. And here he is. I mean, really, this is pathetic. I mean, totally pathetic. This man dressed with a gray suit, with tie, with white shirt, doing his watercolors while the media people are photographing him and videoing him. I mean, this is really, uh, it's actually totally ridiculous. <laughs> He's not an artist, He's not a painter. He does have a huge ego, yes. But uh, was it necessary for him to, to paint his own work? I mean, this kind of narcissism is, uh, it should be a psychoanalytical case study. You know? it's, it's grotesque, actually. I mean, I can only imagine him, you know, come, arriving with a limousine at the, at the site of this, uh, you know, uh, shrine to um, IDOC and government waste, you know, dressed, uh, you know, for a business meeting with his watercolors, you know, in a, in a bag or something. And then it's just, it's pathetic. I like this, you know, I mean, during the construction is real life, big effort, uh, you know, uh, uh, agitating the earth, mother earth, you know, um, raping mother earth in order for the inflated ego of, uh, of the watercolorist in a gray suit to, uh, to have another splendid, uh, uh, you know, presence on, on his CV. Uh, And here they are on the left, the, you know, the mayor of New York, Bloomberg, uh, the senator, the, the governor of the state of New York. And here is Daniel Lipskind, all applauding, all exciting, you know, all excited. And then the modest, the watercolor is here, you know, amazed himself. I'm sure he's all wet looking at the masterpiece that you know, this was the rendering, of course, before it, it, it was built and everybody was applauding. But you read the reactions of the New Yorkers. Garde uh, the Oriental, Lisbon. Uh, here there are some uh, qualities, I would say, you know, well, because he fragmented the, the, the structure and there's some echoes from the Middle Ages. I, this work is, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, better. I mean, it's still, uh, you know, a large uh, constructive effort, uh, but I think it's, it's a little bit more balanced than what we saw earlier in, uh, in New York City. And yes, the, 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 the reference to, you know, the Gothic Cathedral, although here the function is very different, uh, makes it more, uh, you know, appealing or charming. But, but the level of uh, rhetoric is still high here. Garde Lyon, you know, the signature work by Calatrava. Whatever he has to, I didn't yet see a small house built by Calatrava. I would be very curious to see one. Maybe he cannot build small things. He has to be, you know, giant things.
I can look at his watercolors, really. They, 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 they made me uh, hate art. No, it's not true, but that's not art, I think. Liege, another giant thing, you know. If you look at this picture, you could have said this is a, a stadium. It's another station of some sort, you know. but it's very inflated and then. It's probably impressive when you are there, yes. <laughs> I mean, I have to turn against myself. Maybe if I was there, I would love it. I don't know. I don't know. Calatrava reveals one billion scheme for London's Greenwich Peninsula. Another billion, 1,000 millions, I think is a billion, yes. Ah. Uh, Anthropos, Anthropos and Anthropos again, you know, the triumph of man over the world, forgetting that he is himself part of that world. It's typical bridge and then And now I think this is the last work I show, which is um, which shows the the most you know outlandish or uh, I don't know how to call it. I have no words. An incredible cantilevered work. I think it's 75, 78 meters long. It's a museum, and uh, uh, here it is, all for nothing because. Because all this thing, you know, that 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 is apparently, you know, running towards the, you know, the the infinite, towards the absolute, towards what Antoine de Saint Exupéry was longing for at the end of the sea. In fact, it's a, it's a, it's a, again another gesture of megalomania. An empty gesture of megalomania is a triumphalist. I mean, it's one thing to say that art is a longing for the impossible, for the absolute, for the infinite, you name it. And it's another to, 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 to spend huge amounts of money and huge amounts of concrete and huge amounts of steel in order to be this useless thing. It's... Yes, it's monumental. Yes, it's a monument, but it's a monument to maybe to that idiocy that uh, someone criticized in your city, you know, and then and, and waste. It's about waste. And then we have, we are confronted with all kinds of problems. But if there are many Calatravas in the world, and there are uh, in various, uh, you know, ways, uh we shouldn't be surprised that we don't have we only have three seasons lately you know winter is gone is it splendid it is in a in a rather an empty way you know it's it's if i see a you know a, a prehistoric animal around it i would say yes uh, they belong to each other you know, this, uh, it's a future I don't, don't look uh, uh, up to, or uh, it's, but, but, but who knows, maybe visiting it, uh, being there, it, maybe the impression, the perception could be different. Because I remember when I saw pictures with the uh, uh, Fondation, um, Louis Vuitton in Paris, I, I didn't, I was not exalted. But when I arrived there and I entered the building, especially at the top of the building, I, uh, I, uh, I had different perceptions and different thoughts. So please forgive me if I, uh, you know, uh, made the assessments without actually seeing some of these buildings uh, myself, except through pictures, as you do now. Uh, here also, you see this is the man is obsessed by these moving wings, you know, uh, which you, you understand they require immense amounts of uh, of energy in order to, 
to lift that um, so-called wing, that roofing. And what do we see here? We see the giant uh, uh, ships, you know, all filled with tourists. And then we complain that um, the sea levels are going up and uh, the icebergs are melting. But what do we see here? The triumphalism of a human being who refuses to acknowledge the fact that more modesty is needed in the world. It's, it's still ravishing the world in the name of what? In the name of uh, a triumphalist uh, attitude vis-a-vis -vis nature, vis-a-vis -vis the earth, vis-a-vis -vis even our trembling soul, because uh, the buildings by uh, Calatrava do not actually uh, uh, convey great uh, self-knowledge, I would say. It's some kind of uh, architectonic uh, prehistoric animal, but built in the present and with an eye for the future. Rio de Janeiro. Brazil. And I like this picture. I don't like the fact that Getty Images is displaying the, you know, uh, its uh, stamp. But when I saw this picture, I appreciate this uh, young man who is uh, jumping into the water because the spontaneity of his gesture and then, you know, it's a simple gesture uh, that, that brings some life that the building behind it, in my opinion, doesn't have. This child is more alive than the building, or this young man, maybe he's not a child, I don't see very well, but you see. It. Maybe I was too harsh with the Calatrava, but some of the harshest words were not mine, were, uh, you know, um, <laughs> almost screamed by those frustrated New Yorkers. Concrete, 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 steel, reinforced concrete. You know, for what in the end? For an empty show and then a solitary human being, very alone, because in the vicinity of this giant architectural structure, the human being can only feel alone. I am here now, and I uh, will go to the second presentation. I'm not sure if I do a good thing, but it's, a, it's not a long presentation. Since we, we were supposed to talk about uh, uh, concrete today, I'll show some, uh, uh, the beginning of a presentation on brutalist architecture. It happens that I like brutalist architecture in general because I like the uh, what is not what is not said about those who created what is called brutalist architecture that behind the brut uh, the apparent brutalist aesthetics uh, sometimes sometimes I think uh, there is sensitivity. And I know it sounds uh, paradoxical uh, because you wouldn't expect a very sensitive soul behind a brutalist gesture, but I think this, this could be sometimes the case. Uh, poetry requires something enormous, barbaric and wild, said Denis Diderot. Uh, I like this saying from Diderot. Now I think he was not at all someone who well, maybe he created, uh, you know, the encyclopedia, which was enormous, but it was certainly not barbaric and wild. But I like this saying by Denis Diderot, poetry requires something enormous, barbaric and wild. And uh, it reminds me of, an, um, of a quotation from uh, Oscar Wilde, who said, moderation is fatal, only excess succeeds. And brutalist architecture, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, is rather connected with excess and with uh, what is called barbaric and wild, maybe even enormous. 
So architecture with a hammer, to paraphrase uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. And this is a church in Köln, in Cologne, in Germany. And the, uh, it's a building that I admire, and in my opinion is su superior to many buildings done by Santiago Calatrava. Uh, I don't know if it's still you it, if it's if it's used. This church, sorry, I don't know why this image doesn't advance. Okay. Um, the, again, this is just the first attempt towards a presentation about brutalist architecture. I still have to work on it, but I have about 60 or so images and I'll show them to you. This was uh, is something else, it's not the church in Köln. Also brutalist architecture, also a lot of concrete, the polluting concrete. This is the church in, uh, in Vienna, uh, built by a sculptor, not by an architect. Um, and uh, I don't know who built this one. Um, I should know, and I don't even know if it is built actually. A brutalist building threatened by right-wing politicians as part of attack on the, on the welfare state. Uh, yes, there is a hatred towards brutalist architecture, but on the other hand, there is also admiration. For example, in New York City, there was an exhibition uh, called um, Communist uh, Cosmic Constructions about mo mostly, you know, uh, buildings uh, built in concrete in communism. Um, but this is actually the work of uh, Alison and Peter Smithson in, um, in, uh, in Great Britain. And it was, uh, I don't know if it survived. Uh, it, it was meant for demolition, although the architects were very well known, Alison and Peter Smithson. Uh, but uh, yes, um, brutalism is, uh, it had a comeback a success in the last years. There was even a traveling exhibition, SOS uh, Brutalismus. Um, there, is a, there are books published with this very title, SOS, which means danger, SOS Brutalismus. Um, I don't know where this was built. In, uh, in uh, former Yugoslavia, in Serbia, there are some great uh, brutalist structures, uh, truly great, but here we look at a building by uh, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, North American architect. Ah, I'm getting old. I'm beginning to forget. Um, and I made a presentation on him. Uh, I feel like saying Richard Meyer. I'm pathetic. I should stop making the, these presentations. Uh, <clears throat> the housing complex in, uh, in Belgrade. Now I show an image from Serbia. Here it is. Uh, I think these uh, works in concrete uh, do have uh, do have uh, value, do have uh, do have force, and particularly when they uh, try to express a collective, uh, you know, form of living and maybe a collective aspiration. Um, I, I find poetry even in these images. This is also from Belgrade. Brutalist buildings of Belgrade. Here they are. They are more uh, convincing than, uh, you know, uh, large scale uh, housing complexes in Romania. Uh, <clears throat> residential building, uh, Leonardo Savioli, a very interesting architect in Italy and Danilo Santi, 1964, 1967 in Florence. Uh, here it is. Um, Leonardo Savioli, yes, I should make a presentation one day on him because uh, uh, he's truly uh, an excellent architect. Now in Venice, uh, should we call this brutalist? Perhaps not with a lot of conviction. It has a vigor, it has a certain level of, uh, you know, assertive masculinity, but I wouldn't really call it brutalist. It's a rather sophisticated building and even with a certain level of modernity, but anyway, it's in, it's in uh, Florence where it's so difficult to assert yourself as a modern architect. 
Uh, what is this? Also in Italy, uh, Trieste, 1969, 1992, a housing complex, a large housing complex. Uh, socialism was strong in Italy and even communism. And this is shown in, in some architectural projects, especially those of uh, you know, public housing, collect, collective housing, a lot of concrete again. That's why you know, I, I dare to, to talk about, um, about this uh, today. Uh, residential buildings for the military housing cooperative in Madrid, Spain. At least here, the, the green climbs on the building and uh, where the green does so, um, you know, uh, always the result is, uh, in my opinion, positive, always. It doesn't matter how ugly the building, when ivy climbs on the building, it rescues, it rescues it from, uh, from, uh, from ugliness or other negative traits. Madrid, but behind the green, there is a lot of concrete. Brutalist architecture in Barcelona. Um, not particularly brutalist. I, I, I don't even know why. I, I took some of these materials from the web with these titles, brutalist architecture, but for me it's, it's modernistic, but is it really brutalist? I'm not so sure. I mean, there is brutalism in Fritz Wotruba's church in Vienna. Yes, there, there is. But uh, here, uh, now we look at um, the work of Talent de Arquitectura and Ricardo Bofil. And here, yes, here is. And I'm very surprised that Herzog and de Moron, the Swiss architects, built this uh, structure, which is called the Reading Room in China. And I like it very much. It's, yes, it's a sculpture. It's a sculpture which excites people to climb on it and get inside. And, you know, it's, it's provocative. It, it, it is an invitation to explore it. It's kind of a, a building uh, without, a, you know, a prescribed uh, function, despite the fact that it's called the reading room. Uh, I think the title came after the structure was built. I think that the build the building was built without without a, you know uh, uh, anticipating a certain function. And and then you know after it was built, uh, you know uh, possible functions were were found or possible raison d'être for the building to be. In a way, this is what Lebia Suds uh, advised us to do, to first build our buildings and then discover how to live in them, which is, of course, the very opposite of what uh, the functionalist would say or do. This was also built in former Serbia. Uh, they had some very heroic structures built. Uh, there are many of them scattered over uh, the former Yugoslavia, not just in Serbia. This is one of them. It's very, you know, it's, it's, it's surprising and it's still uh, astonishingly fresh and it looks, uh, you know, uh, otherworldly, you know. Yes, in Serbia, uh, they had um, their own version of communism and they encouraged, um, you know, uh, uh, explorations in architecture, perhaps not only in architecture, that were, you know, uh, uh, rather non-conformist and courageous and heroic, like this one. And uh, welcome to Bucharest. I found this uh, picture actually in a kind of Ed memoir with uh, brutalist uh, architectures. Is it a brutalist building? I wouldn't say so, but this, the bottom part, you know, has a certain vigor that some people would say belongs to uh, brutalism, maybe. But this is, this is, and it's actually the work of a sculptor. And I like it very much, uh, uh, particularly because it is darkened by time 
you know, this concrete raw, it's truly a raw architecture. It's a sculptural work. It's actually a sculpture. But um, I find it uh, stimulating uh, uh, visually. And all for the better that it is so-called dirty and dark. I mean, you know, a brutalist architecture should be like this, dirty and dark. Otherwise, you know, excessive Apollonian qualities would um, subtract from its uh, brutalist status. Like here, for example, La Fleur du Mal. Maybe, maybe we, we, can, we can make a presentation or a discussion about uh, Baudelaire and brutalism. And not because both words start, to start with letter B. La Fleur du Mal. Boston City Hall in Boston, uh, USA. Uh, I forgot the name of the architects. Um, I think it's a good work, but some people hate it because it's too heroic and, uh, you know, um, heroic architecture is uncomfortable for many, you know, because it's not sweet, you know, it's not soothing. It's not a soothing architecture. Ministry of Highway <clears throat> Construction, Tbilisi, Georgia, 1975. Look at this. So, Ministry of Highway Construction from 1975 in Georgia. Uh, what uh, um, Rem Kolhas did uh, in Singapore is uh, less radical than what they did in Georgia in 1975. Not bad, a vigorous, um, you know, assault on nature and on, uh, on comfortability and on the bourgeois spirit by um, a courageous construction, which is after all the Ministry of Highway Construction. So I guess, you know, the, the looks of the building uh, serve the, uh, you know, the, the functions within. Yes, we concrete, you can do spectacular things, but let us not forget what we read earlier about the, the effects of using concrete. Basel College of Art and Design in Switzerland, 1961. Concrete again. Tower House in Tokyo, 1966. Concrete again. I kind of like it, you know, it's raw. I don't know if you know, Zaha Hadid, her ideal was to make a, uh, an architecture that was vital, raw, and uh, um, I, think, I think her architecture could be, could be to an extent considered to be vital, but is not raw and is not earthy, because he, she said in a statement, I want to make an architecture that is vital, raw, and earthy, but I don't think he, she arrived at an architecture that is raw and earthy. This one is raw, but it's not earthy. Um, it's hard to do all three of them. Orange County offices and courthouse in New York, 1967. Uh, again, I, I have a. Uh, I'm totally ashamed because I know the architect, and it's just I don't uh, I don't remember his name which is clearly a sign of, uh, of getting old. Um, it's troublesome. I, I, I keep, uh, I keep uh, thinking of someone else and I know it doesn't belong to that someone else. Uh, <clears throat> Brazil, 1974. I think these are the last images of this uh, short attempt to, to describe brutalist architecture. And I like this one more than what uh, Calatrava did in Rio de Janeiro. You know, it's, uh, it's a smaller building. It's, uh, yes, it has its own uh, uh, you know, uh, spectacle. And it is, yes, in concrete. And it is raw and it is uh, brutalist. But I like it. And uh, what is this? Costa Rica, 1976, an apartment building also with uh, lots of concrete. Concrete and concrete again. 
an embassy of Russia uh, in Havana, Cuba, 1985, uh, with the triumphalism that Russia is uh, unable to avoid, unfortunately. Madrid, 2008, Ensemble Studio. They are interesting architects, but they build this house for themselves that, to my, to, in my opinion, is very uh, grandiloquent. Uh, architecture out of the comfort zone, said Deborah Mesa, who is the feminine partner of the, um, of the, of the two architects who built it. It's their own house, but it doesn't look like a house. It's, uh, it almost looks like a highway. This bravura house gives the illusion of a huge weight of concrete supported by nothing more than a sheer glass wall. It is the home of Anton Garcia Abril and Deborah Mesa, principals of the architecture pra practice ensemble studio, who say that engineering took a year while the prefabricated structure was erected in just seven days. This is the house. It's certainly not one of the most bucolic pastoral houses ever built by human beings, no. In fact, if you didn't know it was a house, a private house, you would have said it's some kind of a museum or a, a part of a museum or a museum in the process of becoming. Um, I, I, I'm a, a rather disappointed because I know another work by them which I like very much. But this one is, um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. If I said certain things of a negative nature towards Calatrava, I feel tempted to say something uh, rather similar about this. But again, maybe without, uh, without a uh, direct experience of, of the building, um, I should be a little bit more reticent about uh, expressing uh, judgments. And this is, I end with this, uh, this is actually, uh, I don't know how it was done with Photoshop, with some kind of a, you know, structure or building uh, uh, created by uh, manipulating, uh, you know, images through the many means we have today. And I, I, I like that because uh, I like I like I like this possible impossible building because it's this tension this drama between nature and man between nature and concrete and um, maybe this 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 tension is unavoidable you know we build splendid structures but in time always nature has the upper hand whatever Winnie Ma said that. You know, we should uh, try to uh, outsmart nature. There is no way you can outsmart nature. Plus, we are inside also nature. We are nature too. So, if nature doesn't destroy us, we destroy destroy ourselves, and this can be seen clearly in Ukraine. Thank you.